today we're talking about sampling uh, in the context of kind of what we've been going through so far. So on Monday, we went a little bit over into how we actually do the simulations. It was kind of brief, but we talked about it in the context of iteration and for loops. So we talked about um, that example where we were trying to generate essentially what our happiness is going to be on any particular day. And that was dependent on whether we woke up or slept in. And then we simulated that for an entire week. And then we simulated um, that happiness outcome for an entire year. And then we saw a graph of what the histogram of those scores looks like. So that was kind of an introduction to simulation. We'll be doing that a lot more. Um, and then we also went into probability. So we'll review that a little bit today. And then we'll go into sampling. So how do you actually gather data like out in the real world? Um, how do you actually interpret that data? Why do we even collect samples in the first place? Um, and then we'll also start talking about distributions of large ram random samples. So we've already seen distributions a little bit, but we'll go a little bit deeper into some more practical use cases for distributions and how they actually um, are useful when we're trying to understand something about the data that we've collected. Uh, so a few announcements. Homework five due tomorrow. Turn in today for bonus points. Um, project one due this Friday. Turn in tomorrow for bonus points. And if you flagged a submission for checkpoint, just make sure to reflag it so that it's uh, graded for the final submission. And uh, midterm is on October 16th, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific time. And it's going to be up to and including A-B testing, which I believe will be next Friday's lecture. So that's going to be kind of everything that's going to be on the midterm. And we will have a review lecture up um, on Piazza probably the week of the midterm, like probably around Wednesday or something that week. Actually, probably Tuesday. And then uh, there was one concept that we didn't really get to cover in the probability lecture. We normally do, but we're a little bit behind, so we have to catch up. But um, it's called the Monty Hall problem. So it's a very interesting problem in probability. And um, we've created a video here for you guys to kind of catch up on that. So please watch this. It's very important to understand that problem. And um, you know, you'll have opportunities to kind of ask more about it in labs and things like that. Yeah, please watch that. And then I think Professor Wagner also had one announcement he wanted to make as well. Yeah, so um, I've had uh, multiple reports of, um, of cheating or violations of the course policies on collaboration come to me, um, which always makes me sad. Um, I hate to see it. I hate to see it because your um, folks who are doing that are, are cheating themselves out of a learning opportunity. Um, and um, I think it's dangerous because it's setting up a pattern. You do it's kind of a trap once you do it once, and it's really tempting to do it over and over again. Um, and um, uh, in past semesters, last semester, I had to deal with a whole bunch of cheating cases at the end of the semester. And let me tell you, that's the worst. Uh, it's it feels horrible for me, and it's absolutely horrible for the students. Um, so what um, I thought we'd do is um, before I look at any of these cheating reports. Um, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up, a, I've set up a form um, with a confession opportunity. So I'll give you a brief window. Um, if you, um, you looking back at what you did, realize, you know, what I did wasn't quite right. Um, um, we invite you to, uh, to confess and we will look at anyone who confesses more leniently. I want to give you a chance to come clean and, and, and come right. And um, so it was a reminder of the course policies. Um, um, you should, uh, never be um, looking at anyone else's solution or anyone else's answers. Um, you shouldn't be uh, looking at solutions from previous semesters or asking a friend for their solutions. Um, you shouldn't be sharing your solution with anyone else. So you shouldn't be sharing your code or your answer with anyone else, like not even to ask them, could you check it over and tell me what's wrong with my code or, or, um, or you want to compare yours to mine? Not, not okay. Um, uh, and you'd be surprised by the ways we have to detect this. Uh, I'm a computer security guy, and I'll just give you an analogy. Uh, I know, I mean, we know on the course staff all sorts of ways to detect stuff. So for instance, when Reality Winner leaked documents from the NSA and got caught within a few weeks, how did they catch her? All sorts of ways. One of the ways was each of their printers prints a separate speckle pattern of dots on the page um, that enables to track down which printer was printed on. Now, I'm not saying we got speckle patterns on our on our, on our materials and I'm not saying we don't, but I'm just saying there's a lot of tricks out there and um, we don't catch everyone, but we catch an awful lot. So um, 
please, uh, I would much rather see you confess and give you a more lenient uh, penalty. Um, so please uh, submit by this weekend uh, if you think you've been allowed for that. Um, the one exception is uh, your project partner. You can share anything and everything with your project partner, but you shouldn't be sharing answers or solutions with anyone else. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Professor Wagner. Um, all right. Yeah, so here's the form. Um, it's here as well. And in the chat. All right. So let's quickly review uh, some of the stuff that we talked about last lecture in terms of probability. So we basically went over kind of four different ways to calculate the probability of an event. And um, you know, it just depends on kind of the context of the problem. Sometimes one way is going to be an easier way to do it than another. Sometimes we're going to combine them. And so we saw examples of this as well. Um, so kind of the first way we went about it was, okay, well, if you know that all the different outcomes are equally likely, you could just count up the number of outcomes that result in the events that you care about and then divide by the number of total possible outcomes. So we saw the example of this when we wanted to see, um, you know, what's the probability of drawing a queen when you have three cards of queen, king, ace, followed by a king, um, you know, after you've drawn that first card out. So what's, so basically probably you're getting the se those sequence of events. And so one way we did it was we just counted up all the different ways you could draw two cards out of three. So we, we wrote out, you know, ace, king, ace, queen, king, queen, king, ace, and so on. And then we saw that there's basically six total outcomes. And then there's only one of those outcomes that actually resulted in the event we cared about, which was queen followed by king. So that's why the probability was one out of six. So that was one way to calculate that event. Um, and then another way we talked about is the multiplication rule. So we talked about how sometimes counting out all the different outcomes can work perfectly fine if you don't have that many outcomes. But if you have situations where maybe there's like a lot of outcomes, um, you know, maybe you're trying to draw two cards out of a deck of 52 instead of a deck of 53, then listing the all possible outcomes would be very long and tedious. And so in that case, you might want to do something like the multiplication rule. And the way the multiplication rule works is typically you're talking about two events happening at the same time. So you want like event A and B to both happen. Um, and so when, you, when you're talking about that kind of a chance, what you can do is you kind of split up the way you calculate the probability. So what you can do is basically simplify it into steps. So you can say, okay, I want to know the probability of A and B happening together. So what I can do is, especially this works really well if they're like a sequence of events, like A happens first and then B. Um, then what you can do is you can find the probability that A happens and then multiply by the probability that B happens, given that you already know A happened. And so once again, we use this same trick to actually calculate the same probability of getting a queen followed by king. So we said, okay, first of all, let's find the probability of getting a queen. Well, that's one third in that first draw because you have three cards and you're getting a queen out of it. And then we said, okay, now it's a probability of getting a king, given that we already took the queen out. Um, and so if we've taken the queen out, there's two cards left, the king and the ace. So the probability of that is going to be, the probability of getting a king out of the two cards is going to be one half. So then you just multiply those together, one third times one half, and then lo and behold, you get one sixth once again. So another way to calculate the same probability. And then one thing that's kind of just good to keep in mind about the multiplication rule, we talked about this last time, but basically the answer should be less than or equal to each of the two things that you're multiplying together. And that's because all probabilities are less than or equal to one. So multiply two things less than or equal to one, you should get something that's also less than or equal to one. Um, and then intuitively, this is big, also another way to think about it is you're trying to satisfy more conditions, so you're less likely to satisfy them all. All right, and then we talked about the addition rule. Um, and so this is really useful when you have, when you're trying to look at the probability of an event and there's like a few distinct outcomes that result in that event happening. Um, and so if you have kind of two distinct ways that an event can happen, then you can just find the probability of each one individually and then add them together. So the example we saw for this was um, if you wanted to calculate the probability of getting a queen and a king when you draw two cards out of three, but in no particular order. So like it can be queen first and then king or king first and then queen. We notice that, oh, well actually, that basically means there's two distinct ways that this event can happen. Either I can get queen, queen followed by king or I can get king followed by queen. And so we kind of split it up and then we said, let's calculate the probability of each one. And so we found that the probability of each one was one sixth. You could find that using either the 
multiplication rule or just using equally likely outcomes approach. And then you can add the probabilities together. So one six plus one six gives you a third. So that's how we answer that one. And then lastly, we talked about complements. So this is a general rule of probability that if you're trying to find the probability of some event, um, A, the probability of A not happening is just one minus the probability of A. And it seems kind of like a silly rule, but it's actually very useful because there can be events that are a little bit difficult to calculate using the other three methods. And so then at that point, you might just say, okay, let's try to just maybe calculate the probability of this not happening. Maybe that's gonna be a little bit easier to do. And so in this case, we were trying to understand what's the probability of getting at least one head. And so, you know, if you, and, and one head and like in three coin tosses. So in that case, if you have three coin tosses and you wanna get at least one head, there's so many different ways that could happen. Like you could get a head followed by two tails, you could get a tails, then a head, then a tails. You could get two heads followed by a tail, that also works. So there's just a lot of different combinations and ways that would allow you to get the event we're talking about. And so at that point, you might just say, okay, I think it's not, it's gonna be kind of really tedious to use the other three methods. Let's maybe just try to find the probability of the complement. So the complement is, means that there's no heads. And so no heads is the same thing as getting all tails in all three coin tosses. And so that feels a little bit more manageable because there's only one outcome that, um, that results in that event happening. And so if you want to actually calculate this out, you basically say we have three tosses and we want any outcome except tails, tails, tails. So what we could do instead is just find the probability of tails, tails, tails. And that's just gonna be one half times one half times one half, which gives us one eighth. And so this is a slightly easier way to calculate that. And so once you have probability of tails, 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 just subtract that from one, and that gives you back the probability that we were originally trying to find. Um, and so this is just an easier way to get to that answer by finding the probability of the complement. And then we talked about how the same thing would extend to like 10 tosses. So if you wanted to see what's the probability of getting at least one head in 10 tosses, again, that would have even more possible outcomes that would result in that. So that's gonna be even more complicated. But of course, if you use a complement, it turns out to be quite easy because the complement is just, let's get all tails 10 in a row. And so that's gonna be one half raised to the 10th power. And so we can subtract that from one to get the actual probability of one, which in this case is like almost 100%. So any questions about those four different ways that we calculate probabilities? Okay, cool. So then let's do a discussion session, discussion question, sorry. So let's say you have a population of 100 people and two of them are called Rick and Morty. And we sample two people at random without replacement. So again, without replacement means you have those 100 people, you take out one person randomly. Now you have 99 left, you take out another one randomly from the remaining 99 people. So that's the situation that we're in. And so first question is, given that we're taking two people out without replacement, what's the probability that both Rick and Morty are in our sample of two people that we take out of this population? So that's one question. The other question is, what's the probability that neither Rick nor Morty is in the sample? So we take out two people from this sample, of, or this population of 100, and both of them are not Rick and Morty. So basically Rick and Morty are both still in the population after we take two out. So try to maybe write this down or think through it a little bit and then we'll share kind of the answer in a couple of minutes and just review it. And you know, try to use the four different ways we talked about, see which ones might apply the best here. Okay, so let's try to go over it. And don't worry if you weren't able to get in that time, just want to make sure we kind of stay on track. Um, 
So this first question, probably both Rick and Morty are in the sample. Um, we can actually, and again, this is, there's no order here, right? So it's like either we get Rick first and then Morty, or we can get Morty first and then Rick. So those are kind of the, those are basically the only two outcomes actually that are going to result in this event happening. So we were able to write that out pretty clearly. So we know at least now what are the outcomes that are going to result in this event. So it's Rick first, then Morty, or Morty first, and then Rick. So now we have two different outcomes, and they're both distinct, like they can't happen at the same time. So that means probably we could just add the probabilities together then, um, if we can just figure out how to calculate each one individually. And so probably getting Rick first um, would be one out of 100, because you have 100 people, there's one Rick, so one out of 100. And then probably getting Morty, given that you've already gotten Rick in the first one, that's going to be one out of the remaining 99. So that's, that probability is one out of 100 times one out of 99. And then we have the other situation where you've got Morty first and then Rick. And then similarly, the calculation for that's going to be basically the same thing. So getting Morty first out of 100 people, that's one in 100. Then getting Rick second, given that we already took Morty out, is going to be one out of 99. So this is how we could write it. And so basically you get one out of 100 times one out of 99, which is like kind of the first outcome that results in the event, plus the same thing to get the second outcome. And so then we get result of basically two times uh, one over 100 times one over 99. So this is an example of using kind of the addition rule to add up two different ways that can happen. But then how do we calculate each individual way that can happen? We use a multiplication rule to do that. All right, so now for neither. Um, so for neither, some people said maybe this is just one minus A. You have to be a little bit careful here because um, the opposite of both Rick and Morty being in the sample, there's actually a few different things there. So um, if, the, if you have both Rick and Morty in the sample, that not happening, one situation that includes that not happening is you get just Rick, but not Morty. Or you get just Morty, but not Rick. So those two outcomes are actually part of that entire set of outcomes that is you know, the complement of both Rick and Morty being in the sample. So there's kind of three different situations that are, that are included in that complement. You have, you know, you get just Rick or you get just Morty or you get neither of them. And so in this case, in part B, you are talking about just the specific case where you get neither of them. So doing one minus A isn't quite right. It's almost there, but it's not quite right. Um, so one way to think about this one is, okay, so we know that we don't have Rick or Morty in our sample. So let's try to maybe break it down into steps. So that means that in my first draw of 100 people that I'm gonna draw one person out of, I for sure didn't get Rick or Morty in that one. So how would, what's the probability of that happening? That would be 98 out of 100. Cause that's just like one of the other 98 people. So 98 out of 100, that's the probability of not getting Rick or Morty in the first draw. All right, and then now we go to the second draw what's the probability of not getting Rick or Morty given that we already didn't in the first one? So if we already didn't in the first one, that means we have 99 people left and two of them still are Rick and Morty. So therefore the probability of not getting Rick and Morty again on the second draw is gonna be 97 out of 99. And so we can write this out. So the first one's gonna be 98 out of 100 because again, we don't wanna get those two people. So what's the probability of not getting those two people? It's 98 out of 100. And then now we have 99 people left once again, we don't want to get those two people. So 97 out of 99. And we multiply them because we want to see the probability of both of those things happening in succession. So we were basically saying we want the probability that neither Rick nor Morty is in the first draw and the second draw. So that's why you can multiply them together in that case. Um, so in this case, we're not adding things because they're not two distinct events. They are, we want them both to happen at the same time. Like we want Rick and Morty not to show up in the first draw, and we also do not want Rick and Morty to show up in the second draw. So both of these events need to happen together. That's why we don't add things. You only add things if you don't want them to happen simultaneously. So in the first example, we talked about let's get Rick first and then Morty. That's one event. And then let's get Morty first and then Rick. Those two cannot happen simultaneously. That doesn't make sense. You can't get Rick first and then Morty and then also get Morty first and then Rick. That doesn't make sense. It's not possible. So those are two distinct events. So when the distinct things that cannot happen at the same time, then you add them together. In this case, we want two things to happen at the same time. We want to make sure that Morty and Rick aren't drawn in the first one and they're also not drawn in the second one. So kind of in the same universe, both of those things have to happen. 
So you wouldn't add those together. Um, in fact, you multiply them. So yeah, I guess another way to think about it is basically when you say something is ha event A and event B is happening, that's when you multiply. When you say event A or event B is happening, that's typically when you're going to be adding things. So in the first one, we said, we want to know what's the probability that you get Rick first and then Morty, or the probability that you get Morty first and then Rick. That's why you add things together. In the second one, we're saying, we want the probability that we don't get any of them in the first one, and we don't get any of them in the second one. That's why we multiply them. All right, so I think we'll move on to sampling. So um, when you talk about sampling, we're basically talking about the context of gathering data from a population um, that we want to understand, that we want to study. And um, when we say randomly, um, there's actually like some specific definitions of this. So first of all, you can have a deterministic sample. Um, so in a deterministic sample, the sampling scheme doesn't involve chance. So there's a kind of formulaic methodological way that you're doing it. And every single time you take that sample, you get the same exact set of people in your sample. So that's one way to think about deterministic sampling. Um, and so we'll see some examples of this to, to kind of drive it home. Whereas in a random sample, there's some chance of each person being selected that's not one. Like it's not guaranteed that any person is going to be selected. Um, and then you also have to know what the probability is of any group of people being selected. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of go through an example of this just to like make this a little bit clearer. So don't worry too much about the definition right now. So, um, so for today's example, we're gonna read in this table that contains information about flights operated by United Airlines during the summer of 2015, so quite a while ago. And we're gonna, there's several flights in this data set, it's about 1400 flights or so. And we're going to just do some sampling from this population of 1400 flights. So I'm reading in the table and then we're gonna add a column here called row, which is just gonna like tell us the row number. This is purely just for like a visualization purposes. So you typically wouldn't actually need to do this, um, but we just want to kind of show this in the table as well because it's gonna be helpful for our sampling examples. So here we have our table. So this first column is the new column that we just added called row. So that just helps us kind of keep track of like which row in the data we're talking about. Um, the more important columns are the date. So that's kind of the date of the flight. We have the flight number. Um, we have the destination. So that's the airport destination code. And then what was the delay of the flight? So like in minutes, how late was this flight and taking off? Or maybe how early was it? Like in this case, we had a flight that was three minutes early. Um, in this case, we had a flight that was 257 minutes late. So that's pretty late. Um, and so this is kind of what our data looks like. And so I lived in New York for four years. So I used to fly constantly between SFO and JFK. Um, and so let's actually take a look at all the flights where the destination is JFK. So we'll do United where destination is JFK. And so this gives us all of the JFK flights. And so this is actually an example of a sample. Um, we're getting like a subset of the data and maybe we want to do some analysis with it. But in this case, this is a deterministic sample. So what that means is, you know, there's a specific way that we got this data. And every time we do this sample, we're going to get the same exact set of flights. So every single time I run this code, I get the exact same set of flights. Notice here the rows aren't changing because it's just getting all the JFK flights. Um, so basically the probability of like getting a JFK flight in my sample is one because I'm always going to get a JFK flight every single time I do the sample. So this is not a random sample. In a random sample, when every time you do the sample, you should be getting different results because there's some chance involved. Um, and so we can see another example of a deterministic sample, um, which is slightly more interesting than just taking all the JFK flights. So we could say, let's take all the United flights um, where, well actually let's just take all the United flights uh, every 1000 rows of this data set. So I'm just gonna write this here. So this is np.a range zero up to united.num rows in increments of a thousand. 
So this is going to give me an array of kind of 0, 1,000, 2,000, all the way up to however many rows this table has. It's like around 14,000. And let's just take those rows. So now if you run this, you see here we have the zeroth row, then 1,000, then 2,000, and so on. Um, and so now this is looking a little bit more interesting. This is more of an interesting sample. This is kind of a sample of our data that's showing like, you know, a diverse set of flights that are might actually be representative of the actual population of all flights. But at the end of the day, every time I run this, the result doesn't change. I get the exact same set of flights in my sample. So once again, this is also a deterministic sample. Um, and if you don't remember, take is a function that just returns the rows that you specify. So in this case, we're specifying um, every 1,000th row. That's what should be returned. So that's what take does. Um, and we also try another example. So if you guys can give me just like some random numbers between 0 and 14,000, maybe 0 and 13,000 to be safe. Um, 12,700, I like that one. 30, 40, 1 more, 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah, let's do it, okay. All right, so these are just three random numbers, and then we can take it, and then this is a sample. This is a sample of three flights from the population of all flights that United operated in 2015. Um, so perfectly valid sample, but it is deterministic. So every single time we take this, we get the exact same results. Um, so it's not a random sample. Um, now, if we wanted an actual random sample, then we would actually have to have some kind of randomness involved in the way that we choose them. And so one random sample we could do is we could say, let's pick a starting point. So let's do np.random.choice, np.arange1000. So what this is essentially going to do is it's going to, this is going to return an array from 0 up to 999. And then it's and then this function and get a random choice, which we saw in the last couple of lectures, is going to randomly select one number from zero to nine nine. All right, so that's the first step. So we're going to just pick a random number from zero to nine nine nine, and then what we're going to do is we're going to say and call this systematic sample, and we're going to do united dot take um, every one thousand rows from this starting number that we randomly generated up until the end of the table. So we'll do np.take, or sorry, united.take, np.arrange from start up to united.num rows in increments of a thousand. And then we can take a look at what that does. So I ran this one time. In this case, what happened is it picked a random number from zero to 999. In this case, it was 463. So that was our starting point. And then we said, all right, we got our starting point. Now let's just take every 1,000th row after that starting point. So then we went 1,463, 2,463, so on. So this is a sample, and this is actually a random sample. Seems a little funny, but it is random. Um, if I run this again, now we started at 776, and then we went up every 1,000 rows. So now we have a completely different set of flights. If I run this again, completely different set of flights. So this is actually a random sample. Um, it's systematic in the sense that you're kind of doing every 1,000. So there's kind of some order to the way you did it, but it is a random sample. It's, it's valid. Um, and so that's kind of the distinction there. And one other thing that's interesting is that you don't need to have uh, your sample be such that all the individuals have to have an equal chance of being selected. The most important thing, though, is that you just need to be able to calculate beforehand what's the probability of any group of people in the population being selected. So in this systematic sample we just did, the probability of any one flight being selected was essentially one in a thousand. Um, and so we can calculate that beforehand. And it's not, the, as long as the probability of, you know, the individuals being selected isn't just like one, then it's, then it's actually a random sample. So those are kind of two conditions. Probability shouldn't just be one because that's deterministic and you should be able to calculate the probability um, of any, any individuals being selected. All right, so another kind of sample, this is a third kind of sample, which might seem like it's random, but it's not really, is a sample of convenience. And so this is a sample that satisfies one of the conditions. So it does satisfy the condition that like the chance of someone being selected isn't 100% because you're just 
taking something by convenience, but it does, but it does not satisfy the condition where you can calculate the probabilities beforehand necessarily. Um, and so this is an example of where you just like stand outside some building and then just whoever walks, whoever happens to walk by you, like you just include them in your sample. So let's say you kind of understand something about some city, uh, the population of the city. And so you just go to like their capital building and just like wait outside and just like as people walk by, like that's my sample. So that's a sample of convenience. Um, and it might appear like it's random because like every time you do that sample, you're gonna probably get different results. So, you know, you are satisfying that condition, um, but you aren't really satisfying the actual condition of, you know, what's the probability of each individual person actually being selected. You don't actually know that. Um, it's, you know, you basically can't calculate that. And so in that case, you don't actually have a random sample. So these are kind of things that are really important. And in general, when you're collecting data, like out in the real world, it's just really important that you, when you're trying to study some population, you're making sure that you're trying to get a sample from the population that actually represents that population, um, like the, the population as a whole, and you have some kind of systematic way of gathering that data in such that you know what's the chance of kind of any individual person or any group of people being selected in the population. So those are kind of the main con uh, connections we're talking about here. Um, is a sample of convenience used a lot for polling? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, so if you have like exit polls and things like that, um, you could potentially say that's a sample of convenience. But at the same time, in that specific case, you are trying to understand the population of people who voted maybe at that particular polling booth. Um, and so in that case, you're actually, are, you actually are getting a random sample of the people you want there. But obviously you probably don't wanna just like wait outside for a particular like hour of time and then just ask people you know, who they voted for. Um, a more systematic way would be maybe you would make sure you ask everybody who like leaves the vote from that booth that day or maybe like every fifth person who leaves, you stop them and say, hey, can you let us know who you voted for? So doing something like that will be a little bit better. Um, that would actually be considered a random sample. But if you're just gonna wait there for like, maybe like a one hour window at some random part of the day and then just ask people leaving, that's not gonna be good. Um, so typically as it, as it polls are gonna be done in some systematic way where it's gonna be representative of the people who actually voted from that particular group. So that's a really good question. All right, so that's sampling. And then let's kind of finish up with distributions. So we've talked about distributions in this class already. We've seen two examples of distributions. Um, so, you know, we talked about categorical distributions, uh, which we said we use bar charts to visualize those. And we talked about numerical distributions and we use histograms to visualize those. And if you guys remember, um, a distribution, at least in the context of like categorical distribution is really just, you know, count up all the unique values that you have and write out how many times each one comes up. That's essentially what distribution is. It's just kind of two columns of data. So, you know, unique values, how often does each one come up? And so that's typically how you talk about distribution of an actual data set. Um, and so today we'll talk a little bit more about kind of theoretical distributions, things like that. So firstly, um, this is concept of probability distribution. And so this basically talks about if you have some random quantity that can kind of change its values every time you observe it, um, it has different possible values. And so in this case, it's not really counting up how many values, how many times the values appear. It's more just what's the probability of seeing that value. So one good example of this is a, is a die. So if you roll a die, right, you have six faces. And so the probability distribution of each face, the probability distribution is gonna basically be one, two, three, four, five, six. Those are the unique values. And then the probability of each one coming up. So one six is gonna be kind of the probability for each of those values. And so that's an example of a probability distribution. Um, a coin flip is another example, a little bit simpler. So you either have heads or tails. Those are the two different possible outcomes. Probability of each one is one half, um, if it's a fair coin. So another way to think about probability distribution is kind of like, if I were to do some samples or simulations of this random quantity, this is kind of how many times the, the, like the relative amount of times each unique value should show up. So if you did like a die roll like many, many times, you should see that you get um, you know, a face of one 
one sixth of the time. You should get a face of two one sixth of the time. So that's kind of what probability distribution is essentially telling you. That's why it's called like theoretical as well. So it's like this is what should happen, um, you know, in the long term. And so this is always in the context of some random quantity, you know, with various possible values. And so just writing this out again, it's these two lines here essentially. So all the possible values of the quantity and then the probability of each of those unique values. So it's very analogous to the way we've already talked about distributions before. Um, and so, you know, with things like rolling a die or flipping a coin, it's pretty straightforward to calculate the probability distribution. Uh, but, you know, in actual data science, we typically have much more complicated examples where the random quantities are really complex. They can maybe take on many different values. Maybe they're numerical and they can take on infinitely many values. And it's just really hard to actually calculate the true probability distribution. Um, and so in that case, it's useful to maybe do things like simulating taking a sample um, and trying to figure out if we can maybe guess at what that probability distribution must be. So a good example of this is, you know, if we took everybody like in, uh, in UC Berkeley and we wanted to know, you know, what's the probability distribution of their um, political party, like are you Democrat, are you Republican, are you independent, like whatever. So, you know, there is some true probability distribution. Like if you take however many students there are in UC Berkeley, there's some number of students we know, and there is a true probability distribution of, you know, what percent of the people are Democrat, what percent of the people are Republican, what percent of the people are independent. There is a true answer there, but that might be very difficult for us to actually calculate. Um, and so, one way we could maybe try to do that is we could take a sample, look at what the distribution of the parties are within our sample, and that could be one way to kind of guess at what the actual probability distribution is of our population. In this case, our population would be you know, all students in super Berkeley. So that's kind of one way you can think about it. Um, and so we're gonna find a lot of examples like that where basically just simulation is a good way potentially to try to understand what the underlying distribution actually is of the population. And so when you actually simulate or sample um, from your population, then you have something which is called the empirical distribution. So empirical distribution is kind of like observed. So this is the actual relative frequencies that we observe. So how often does Democrat come up in our sample? How often does Republican come up in our sample? So that would be essentially empirical distribution. And so just to kind of make this a little more explicit, so empirical means based on observations, it's observed. Um, and these observations can be from repetitions of an experiment. So either you're like simulating like coin flips or you're taking a sample of people from the UC Berkeley campus. And what's the actual definition? So it's very, very similar probability distribution. It's all the observed values, all the ob unique observed values, I should say. Um, and the proportion of times each value actually appears. So remember, in probability distribution, it's all the unique values that this quantity can possibly take. Um, and then what's the probability of those values actually appearing if you like observe this random quantity one time. Whereas in the empirical distribution, we have already observed several values. We may not have observed all the possible values, but whatever values we have observed, let's find the unique values that are there. And then what's the proportion of times each of those unique values show up. So it's very, very similar, but it's just kind of the more practical, I guess, um, viewpoint of, of the probability distribution. So let's see some examples of this. Um, I think I've talked about it enough, but it's always helpful to actually see it. So we can actually see it in the context of uh, a die roll, first of all, because that's, I think, a little bit more tangible. So let's create a table that has all the faces of a die. So we're gonna say table with column face, and then we're gonna put np.a range one to seven. So again, one to seven means one, two, three, four, five, six. And then let's just take a look at that. So here we have our die, it has these different faces. And so here we've essentially visualized a probability distribution because we're looking at all the different values that can come up. And in this case, they're all equally likely. So the probability of each one coming up is just one sixth. So this is essentially um, a probability distribution of our die. So our die is this random quantity. Every time we roll it, we get a different value. We get a random value. Um, so that's the probability distribution. And if you wanted to see an empirical distribution of this die, what we could do is we could just roll it. So we could roll it 10 times. And how, we, how do we do that? We could just do die.sample, 
pass in 10, and that's going to do 10 random rolls of this dice, of this die. So in this case, we get a five and a six and two and a five and four and a five and so on. And so what we're looking at here, this is essentially an empirical distribution. Um, and we can actually kind of calculate out what the distribution is here. So we got five, let's see, one, two, three, three times. So the proportion of times that a five came up was three out of 10. And then we got a six, uh, looks like two times. So the proportion of times we got a six was two out of 10. We got a two only one time. So the proportion of times a two came up was one out of 10 um, and so on. So you can basically calculate what proportion of times each of these values actually came up. And so, you know, it's not exactly one six and that's because it's a sample and you know, empirical distribution is gonna look a little bit different. But that's the basic idea is that's how we can calculate the empirical distribution. Um, and so again, if we sample basically just takes um, a, a random value from this table and then does the same with replacement does that 10 times. And that's, that's essentially what we're seeing here. Um, and so we can also visualize these distributions as well. So let's first visualize our probability distribution of the actual die itself. Uh, one way we can do that. So I'm just going to make some bins here so that we can visualize this properly. So don't worry too much about that. Um, and then we're going to do die.hist and bins equals roll bins. So die, remember, is a table that contains all the unique values of the die. So just one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we view this as a histogram, this is actually what a probability distribution looks like. So you can see each of the unique values and you can see what's the probability of that value coming up if you looked at kind of one instance of that random quantity. So, um, you know, the probability of getting a one is gonna be one sixth. The area of this, um, this bar is gonna be one sixth. The area of all these bars is actually one sixth. And then if you add them all up together, uh, you get a probability of one. So this is one way that we can actually visualize the probability distribution of our die. And then if you wanted to visualize an empirical distribution, we'd have to sample first, and then we could visualize how often each of the values actually came up in the sample. Um, so again, we could do that. So I'm just gonna copy this code, put it down here, and then instead of die, we're gonna do die.sample10. And so that'll do 10 random rolls of the die, and then you can visualize a histogram of that guy. And so if we run this, now this particular empirical distribution looks like this. So we happen to get this one um, a few times, we got the three twice as often, we got the four three times as often as we got a one, and then we got the six uh, four times as often as we got them. So you can see the different ways here that we got them. And so in this case, we have the proportion of times that each number came up. And so what's interesting about this empirical distribution is, you know, it doesn't really look exactly like the theoretical distribution. And part of the reason is because we didn't sample that many, we only sampled 10. Um, and so there's just like a lot of variability in what could happen. And so we could actually run this again to see how it changes up. So let's do another 10 rolls and see what those look like. All right, so these look a little bit more evened out actually, which is interesting. Um, so now in this case, every number actually came up. In the last one, a couple of numbers never even came up. Um, but once again, this gives you a sense of what empirical distribution look like. And so just a way for us to maybe approximate what the probability distribution of the die is. And so why is this helpful? So imagine that we didn't actually know what this die looks like. We don't know that it has six faces. We don't even know that it has like one, two, three, four, five, six. We don't know anything about it. It's just some object and it spits out a number, right? So imagine it's like that. It's like hidden behind a curtain. And so all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna roll it and then I'm just gonna tell you what number it has. And so if you wanted to figure out what's the distribution of all the kind of values this could have, um, that would be really hard to do because you don't, you don't have access to the die. You don't know what it is. And so one way you could try to figure it out or maybe guess at it is you could just sample from it. So you could tell me and say, hey, I want you to roll this 10 times. Just tell me what numbers come up. And so I can do that. You can then plot the distribution and you can get some guess at, okay, I think maybe this random quantity takes on these values this often. And then if you wanted to make the guess even better, you could do a larger sample. So let's actually go with 100. Um, rolls. So if we go with 100, now it looks slightly different. Um, and we can run this again. 
now it looks even more different. So still, even with 100 rolls, it does move around quite a bit. But at least we're not getting a situation where like none of the numbers come up at all. Because if you remember the first time we did the um, 10 rolls, like number, the second phase didn't even come up at all, even once. So at least that's not happening now. So it's like, it looks like this is getting a little bit closer to what the actual probability distribution is. Um, and then if you did like a thousand, so let's do a thousand rolls instead and then visualize the empirical distribution of that. Now it's starting to look more like the probability distribution. Um, so it's not exactly the same, but it's certainly looking like pretty similar now to, to the actual theoretical distribution of this die. And so this is kind of the power of sampling. So as you like have more and more samples of this random quantity, you can better understand its, pro its true probability distribution. That's the basic idea. And so even if you didn't know what a die was, if you took a lot of samples like this, you could start to get a sense of like, okay, it looks like probably these, these, all these different values tend to come up almost equally likely. Um, and so that's one way you could do it. Uh, someone said, what about one million rolls? Uh, we could try that, I guess. Let's do a million rolls. I don't know how slow this is gonna be. It might take a while. Oh, that's pretty fast. Okay, so now you see it's like almost flat. Like this is very little differences here. So with a million rolls, it's like almost the same thing as a probability distribution at that point. Um, <laughs> someone tried a billion and their kernel died. Yeah, so gotta be a little bit careful there. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is what's so beautiful about sampling and so powerful. And so it turns out that this concept that we just explored where like, let's take larger and larger samples and it looks more and more like the probability distribution. This is actually like a law essentially in statistics. And it's one of the most important things you will learn in this class. So this next slide is like super, super important. Um, like just have like the alert going, going on right now, alert emoji, um, just law of averages, law of large numbers. So this is basically how we um, express what just happened. So what it's basically saying is if you repeat a chance experiment many, many times, such as rolling a die, um, and you do it independently under the same conditions. So every time I roll that die, it's the same way I rolled it and it's independent. So like the outcome I get in the next die roll has no dependency on the previous rolled outcome. Then the proportion of times that an event occurs, so like getting a one or getting a two or getting a three, those are all three different events. Um, that proportion gets closer and closer to the theoretical probability of it happening. Um, and so that's essentially what we saw. So, you know, we did 10 rolls and then like the, the empirical distribution was like jumping all around every single time we did 10 rolls. And then once we got to a million rolls, then the distribution looked really, really similar to the actual probability distribution where they're all equally like. Um, and so that's an example of that case. And so as you increase the rolls of a die, the proportion of time you see the face with five spots, you know, for example, gets closer to one six. That's essentially what we saw. And so this is called law of averages, law of averages. So I think we'll actually stop there, but any questions about this? How do you visualize a probability distribution? So that's actually what we did up here. Um, this was visualizing the probability distribution. And how do we do that? Well, first we created a table called die, which just had all the unique values that this quantity can take. Um, so essentially up here, we had created this table and it has a column called face and it just has one through six because that's, that's the unique values it can take. And we know that they're equally likely. So each number just shows up one time. So you did one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we just plotted uh, the histogram of those values. So that's how we did that there. If we had like a weird die where maybe like it's a seven face die, but there's two ones and then all the other numbers just show up one time each, then you would want to create a table with an extra one in it and then draw the histogram uh, of that. So that's one way if you wanted to like change up the distribution rule that you could do that. Um, When would we want to use np.random.choice versus .sample? So np.random.choice is used on an array of values. Um, so I think we used it farther up here, let me see. Yeah, right here. We did np.random.choice, np.a range, you know, 1000. So we said, let's take a random value in this array from zero to 1000. So that's how we use np.random.choice. And then we use sample on a table. So die is a table, and we said die.sample10. Um, and so that, that this basically just took 10 things from the table. 
So they both do similar things, but on arrays versus tables. Uh, yeah, so what if it had all, what if the die had six faces, but not all the faces were equally likely? So um, as I said, you could, you could actually do this. So let's say, for example, a one shows up twice. Like let's say a one is twice as likely for some reason. So what I could do is we could do um, np.append and I'll take this set of numbers one to six and I'll add a, um, a one to it as well. And so now we have one shows up twice here. So see there's a one up here and a one down here. So now the probably distribution is gonna be slightly different. So now if we actually visualize a probability distribution, we see that one is twice as likely now as the others. So we've just changed the probability distribution of this die. Maybe this is kind of like a weird die that has two ones on it. So that's how you can do that. Um, empirical distribution, how do you visualize that? So in order to visualize an empirical distribution, you want to sample from your data, from your population, or you want to simulate um, you know, several outcomes from your random quantity. So we did the latter here. So we took our random quantity, which is the die roll, the die, and then we sampled it 10 times. Once we had it sampled 10 times, then we said, okay, let's draw a histogram of that. So you just sample your table of kind of theoretical values and then draw a histogram on that sample. And so that's what we did here. Because this allows us to visualize that. Can I show the code for adding the one again? And you guys really want to play around with this a little bit? Okay. So yeah, this is how I did it. So Originally, I just had np.arrange one to seven, um, but I said I wanted to add an additional one in there because I want one to be twice as likely as the others. So then I just used np.append, which we learned about last time. And so I did np.append one to six, append uh, a one at the end of it. And so that's how we get this. Yeah, can you explain sample of convenience? So. Sample convenience is basically just kind of like you, I mean, it, it's just a good example of it, like I mentioned, is like you just stand outside a building and then you just wait for people to kind of walk out. And if you're trying to understand something about the population of that entire city, but you just go to like one particular building and just like wait for people to come out, that's essentially a sample of convenience. What you'd really want to do is be able to systematically get, you know, people from the entire population that you care about. Now, if you actually care about, if your population that you want to study is just maybe the people who work at this building, um, then potentially waiting for people to come out could make sense. But there's like specific conditions that need to be satisfied there still, because you know, you'd want to make sure that like everybody has a chance to go out, come out through that building. And, you, and that way you can actually calculate the probability of any individual person being sampled. So you need to know kind of the habits of everybody in that building. You need to know that like, they're all going to come out of this exit or maybe like, Half the people come out of this exit and half the people come out of the other exit. If you know all of those things and you know the probability of any individual like coming out of one of those exits and all that stuff, then you could say it's a random sample. Um, but typically when you talk about sample of convenience, it's more just like, oh, I'm just gonna wait outside. I don't know anything about this population. I don't know like the probability of actually selecting any random individual. And so at that point, it is random because it's changing around, but it's not actually a random sample. Because you don't actually know the chance of getting any individual person. So that's really, really important. Uh, when you did die.sample10, how did it know to just randomly choose one of the six numbers in the table? So that's just how a sample works. So sample basically says, let's pick one random value from all the rows in this table. And so in this case, it, originally this table had six rows, now it has seven rows. So if we ran this again now, you would, you would also draw from one, this additional one here as well. So if we now go through this, actually it might be interesting to go through that. So now if we do a sample of 10, looks like one is coming up a little bit more. And so now if we do like that sample of 1 million from this new die, which has like an extra one, we see that in a million rolls, we also get way more ones than the other numbers. So it's not just the unique values. Sample is gonna just take all the rows in your table and then just pick a random row. It's essentially what it's doing. And yes, you can sample um, with a table with more than one column. So we'll do that a lot in this class. That's gonna be super, super useful because we're gonna collect like a lot of data from people and we're gonna have all these different things we observe about them. 
and we're going to want to sample the entire row. So sample works for the entire row, actually. Um, so yeah, definitely you can use that if you have multiple columns. Oh, uh, someone asked about the A range for the bins here. So I wanted these bars to be like centered on the integer values. Like I want this bar to be centered at one. So that's why I wanted to make my bins from 0.5. So basically I said it was do 0.5 to 1.5, then 1.5 to 2.5, then 2.5 to 3.5. So I just wanted the, the bars to look nice. If you don't specify the bins, like Python does something kind of weird and it doesn't look as nice. You can try it out, but I'm not a fan of that. So I wanted to do it this way. It just looks a little bit nicer. <laughs> Someone asked what's my favorite function in Python. I don't know if I have a favorite function. Um, I have to get back to you on that. I like plotting though, I'll say that. I like, I like anything that plots stuff because I, I like visualizations a lot. Um, in the lecture demo, there's a die.his. Uh, it's probably, in the lecture demo, it's probably referring to what I did here. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to, but they were probably just doing die.his. Maybe I, I forgot to like write it in the exact same way I did it here. Um, but maybe, oh, maybe I did it without the bins entry. That's probably what it did. So I, I can just show you actually what that does. It doesn't look nice. So if you just do a die out of his without specifying bins, then it does this, this kind of weird thing where like this bar is from like one to 1 1.5 and this is two to 2.5. And then this last bar is like from 5.5 to six for some reason. So it's just like, I don't, I don't like this. Um, maybe his is my least favorite function. I don't know, but I'm not a fan of this. So I specified the bins like this because I think that just looks nicer. Um, so this is what it looks like when you don't put bins. I, I just kind of skipped that for, for this lecture because I didn't really want to even mention it because it doesn't look good. I, just, I don't like it, so, <laughs> um, yeah. Cool, all right, I think I'll stop there, or at least I'll stop the screen share, but we can keep going in terms of questions.